A book was delivered to my house in Leeds, this one. And uh, it's a great book. Great book because it doesn't remind you of any other, really. <laughs> it is a very, very original book. Very original book, which uh, is uh, highest caliber empirical work and highest caliber theoretical work. Something like uh, the great philosopher of the 19th century, Hegel, uh, name I hope familiar to you, mm, defined philosophy. The substance of philosophy, what philosophy is doing. Philosophy at that time, I would like to uh, recall, was still understood in its original meaning. Philosophy, love of wisdom. So what is the function of philosophy, he said, is to capture time in the network of concepts. And that's what this book is doing. It's trying to capture our time in the network of concepts. And it is tremendously topical. It is tremendously well aimed. It hits the bull's eye when it tries to capture the substance of our time in the network, in the net uh, woven of uh, uh, concepts. Extraterritorialities in occupied world. I suggest to you that it is not just a one project of two very nice people who came together and decided to uh, uh, see the issue of exterritory, extraterritory, um, bringing together the bits and pieces of knowledge from every possible branch of scholarship. I suggest to you that it is a central problem of our time. A history of the time which we are living at the moment, who knows, perhaps it will be written in terms of the rapid and very profound changes in the idea of extraterritoriality and in the idea of occupation, particularly occupation in relationship to the world in which we live. They are changing. They are changing, they are just jumping out from nowhere under different disguises. I would like to select one of these disguises which I think at the moment makes this book particularly uh, topical, particularly important contribution to this on, on <coughs> never-ending process of catching time in the network of concepts. Uh, and that is the problem which Brad Evans recently in an interview uh, asked me to answer, he referred to the latest, what could be called migration panic or migration um, moral panic. And uh, his question was, do you think the current a refugee crisis engulfing Europe represents yet another chapter in the history of flight from persecution, or is there something different taking place? Well, very intriguing, very fascinating question, very high challenge. In uh, the rest of my talk today, I will try to answer this question of his. Is it just another chapter or is it there something different taking place which we didn't confront before? Well, there are two answers to that uh, to start with. The both parts of the question are related to very important things which do happen in our time. 
On the one hand, this is another chapter in history of flight from persecution, but above all, masses of people abandoning their homes, abandoning their, their workshops, abandoning their neighborhoods, and being forced to move er elsewhere. It is another chapter. Modern times, uh, my dear friends, are specializing from the very beginning in producing redundant people. Redundant in the sense that in this particular context there is no use for them. They can't be uh, utilized in any meaningful way of the world. Modernity did it from the very beginning because it is modernity and modernity has to uh, very important features, apart from many others, which uh, I have no time to mention. But these two features, which are relevant to our issue, uh, are two huge factories of redundancy, which are inalienable of living in a modern way of life. The one of them is the modern obsession of order building. We are all constantly remaking orders. And that is the essence of order making, that whenever you want to replace one order with another, then some people are becoming out of place. They don't fit. They don't fit. They have to be written off. <coughs> gotten rid of. God, for all sorts of reasons, they may, <coughs> they may believe in different kind of God, they may uh, stick to their own tradition, all, histo all, all, all historical memory, which doesn't suit the requirements of the new um, order. Anyway, they are becoming out of place. They have to be get rid of. In all sorts of ways, they may be rounded up and kicked out. They may be forced to run away to sh for, for life, to save their life from <coughs> inhospitable world. But nevertheless, they are set in motion. The second industry producing, uh, modern industry producing uh, redundant people is uh, what we call economic progress. What does it mean, economic progress? It does mean that uh, things which we were doing yesterday can be, do, uh, can be, done, can be done now with much uh, lesser expenditure, less labor, less uh, effort. By the same token, with every step of economic progress, as we understood it now, some people become redundant. Some ways of earning living become not any longer available, not ever any longer suiting this purpose. So, we see mass migration for many centuries, three or four centuries already, of it history of modernity. One thing, however, changed very uh, substantially, and that was that uh, Europe, where we are now, until the referendum, Britain, by the way, uh, which is coming, uh, but we are at the moment in Europe, and Europe, at some point, was the only continent in the whole planet which entered the road which you call modernity or modernization. That gave its advantage. The mass migration started from centrifugal movement from Europe to America, North America, South America, Africa, parts of Asia to Australia, New Zealand. According to some estimates, <coughs> about 60 million of your ancestors emigrated from Europe in order to establish their new life on the other side of the ocean. 
Uh, for these reasons, either they couldn't find any meaningful employment in their own country because they, uh, the way in which they used to eke out their existence was no longer a uh, reasonable <coughs> way of doing just that. Or they ran away, they were refugees, to the pioneers so-called coming to North America, uh, were refugees from religious persecution or from uh, other aspects of budding totalitarianism in the European continent. They wanted to re-establish their life standing on their own feet, being free men. Well, in the times of this centrifugal movement, Europe could use people who were redundant in their own, uh, on, in their own homes, uh, in the, uh, use, it, use them as expeditionary armies to conquer other lands of other people, <coughs> to create colonial administration. It was the period of colonialism uh, culminating <coughs> in the uh, imperialism known to you also from history. Europeans emigrated from Europe in massive quantities. Now we have another situation. We have, from the point of view of Europe, centripetal movement. Former empires emigrate back to their mother, mother country. <coughs> they are coming here. And that is the novel situation. That is the novel situation which really uh, shocked quite a few Europeans. It uh, coinc coincides with a uh, tremendous explosion of xenophobia, chauvinism, hatred of others, <coughs> and what could be only called security obsession. Well, there are two kinds of people who come to Europe, not to our gates. One kind are uh, what is called economic migrants. People who very much because of our own misdemeanor our own making, setting in motion, setting in motion, free, free floating all around the planet. The capitals, the finances, the industrial investment funds, information, but also criminality, uh, weapon trade, drug trade, and so on. That is our making. We have done that. We have done that, and uh, once we have done that, we brought about the worldwide triumph of the neoliberal so-called economy, which means that uh, millions of people around the world lost their living. <coughs> According to some current estimates, there are two hundred million homeless people around the world who had to abandon their workshops, their plots of land which they had, their herds of cattle, uh, simply because they couldn't live out of it any longer, and went around doing what every rational person would do. And allegedly, we modern, modern people are in favor of rationality, in favor of reason. They try to find conditions to, for life in places where there is more bread, more drinking water, and more chances to make meaningful life and purposeful life. 
Paul Collier, I recommend that book to, to you, recently published a book called Exodus, Immigration and Multiculturalism in the 21st Century. And I will quote some of him. <coughs> the first fact is that the income gap between poor countries and rich ones is grotesquely wide. And the global growth process will leave it wide for several decades. The second fact is that migration will now not significantly narrow this gap because the feedback mechanism like people working abroad, sending their money back to their families, the feedback mechanisms are too weak. And the third fact, which he points out, is that as migration continues, the diasporas will continue to accumulate for some decades. And diasporas, we are living already in diasporas world, it is uh, enough to make a walk along the London streets to, eat, to see, to meet on one walk on half a mile or even less uh, people representing very many of allegedly 70 different diasporas which share the London territory. <coughs> diasporas are facilitators of this mass movement. The larger is local diaspora coming from a particular country overseas, the more there is a chance that more people from the same place they, they will follow suit. That is the question of <coughs> economic migrants. And uh, Collier also computes that between uh, 1960 and 2000 uh, what took off from under 20 million to over 60 million was migration from poor countries to the rich ones. As he suggests that uh, there will be further increase of that, further increase I remind you again what I already said, 200 million of people. Just compare it with the moral panic created by the recent wave of migration, allegedly about between one and one and a half million people came to Europe, but there are 200,000 who can't afford even the smugglers, which uh, Offer, offer them the place in the unseaworthy ships or other boats um, in order to smuggle them into Europe. There is a delayed bomb waiting. Our memory in present times is ever shorter. The time stretch of the war is ever shorter. So perhaps you don't feel still today in March as strongly about the problem of migration as we all felt uh, still four or five months ago. There is a moment of, uh, of relief between what I suggest to you, a new wave which is waiting at our uh, gate uh, in order to knock to our homes. Uh, so the attempt, at least, of, uh, of being able to enter the richer country where chances of survival are greater than at home, well, uh, uh, will be with us for a very long time to come. But they are economic. Migrant. 
Another new element here is uh, the masses of refugees, of outcasts, who had to run from their homes, from their familial places, where they would be delighted to spend the rest of their life because they felt they were really at home, were forced to run away in order to save their life. And that's again, that's again, uh, my dear friends, <coughs> a new phenomenon. I wonder whether you are aware that a part of Africa, a long belt and a wide belt between two tropics, two tropics, Cancer and Capricorn doesn't have a single viable working state. It is a place completely set out of order. Uh, the place which, uh, <coughs> which, uh, uh, in fact, could be only defined as a massive factory of refugees. Again, it is our doing. Let's be absolutely clear about that. The uh, destabilization of the Middle Eastern area in the aftermath of miscalculated, foolishly myopic and abortive policies and military ventures of the West, well, that's the one reason of the massive influx of refugees. The other one is also the product of globalization, Western style, namely uh, the globalization of the weapon industry and weapon trade. On the one hand, the operators of the globalization are the smugglers of weapons, the greedy, for profits. On the other hand, uh, there are governments greedy for the GDP figures. If Britain sells weapons at high, high profit, then well, see, there will be a little bit less unemployed in Britain. People will have more jobs and everybody will be grateful and everybody will be satisfied. Combine these two things and we, you, what you have is uh, that uh, it is a world saturated by weapons. And weapons fitting not the invading armies as they did still 40, 50 years ago, but weapons serving the situation of civil wars. Guns, hand weapons, weapons easy to hide, easy to smuggle through the borders, and uh, very, very uh, handy when it comes to playing out the religious conflicts, the ethnic conflicts, and all other antagonism which are foolish, uh, which are what is foolish. We already created a situation which can be only compared to what uh, the great Estonian uh, linguist philosopher Lotman uh, called uh, using the metaphor of minefield. Minefield, ladies and gentlemen, is a place of which you are aware that it is full of explosive and you draw a reasonable conclusion that sooner or later there will be an explosion, but there is no way in which you can predict when and in which particular place. But the necessity already determined occurrence of explosives must, must happen. Uh, the great uh, playwright, in Russia, Anthony Chekhov, in Goldsmith College, I'm sure there are plenty of people knowing his name and having read him, once uh, was asked by, uh, by uh, 
uh, us aspiring playwrights, younger than him, to give them some sort of advice, a recipe for a realistic play, theatrical play, realistic. Because Chekhov, one of the trademarks of Chekhov, that he was precisely very realistic portray, portraitist of the conditions of Russian life at his time. Well, his answer was, among other answers, was very simple. Remember, in the first, if in the first act of the play there is a rifle hanging on the wall, then in the third act it must be fired. Now that's a realism for you. Don't be surprised. Don't. Don't, don't, be, don't, don't be shocked if there is another massive, spectacular, so-called terrorist act played here or there or anywhere, because here and there or anywhere we are, I repeat, full of weapons as our ancestors never were in history. So refugees. Refugees, ladies and gentlemen, are relatively new phenomenon as far as European hospitality is tested. They are coming on show in a very peculiar time. That is the novel element, not just the next chapter, but something really new. In European countries, you know, there was all sorts of a crisis recently. There was a um, credit crisis. There is a crisis of uh, Eurozone. There is falling GDP or stagnant GDP. There is a rising unemployment. And there is new kind of worldwide inequality, also unknown in the past. An inequality in which you don't count, you don't compare any longer the situation of the top half of society and the low half of society. But you compare 1% at the top with all the rest. In, of the extra value which has been produced in the United States of America since 2007, since the credit crisis, 93% of this extra value was appropriated by 1% of the richest people in America. While all the rest was increasingly fragile, brittle, frail, felt uncertain about their situation, one serious illness could destroy all their, all their property, whatever they earn by hard work in the course of their professional life. It, they are called, I hope you already uh, grasped this new name uh, given to them by Professor Guy Standing, name of Precariat. Precariat, the concept taken from French precarité, which means uh, walking or moving sand, which means being uncertain, which means not knowing what uh, next day will bring, not knowing whether when you wake up tomorrow your job will be still there waiting for you or not. And uh, in this uh, so-called uh, recovery, <coughs> economic recovery of the United States, this class of precariat has no participation. The uh, average income of what was called middle classes, now it is renamed precariat, is falling down. The result. The result, my dear friends, I think is just the overwhelming feeling of uncertainty. Uncertainty. 
I think that's the greatest fear which we experience. Now, the premonition that uh, we are no longer in control of our life. Premonition that uh, there is no correlation between the degree of my talents, my efforts, my hard work, and uh, the stability of my future and, and prospects for my children. That this, that this correlation had been broken. Feeling of uncertainty. And that is, I suggest to you, very important point if you have to uh, <coughs> grasp what is novel in this extraterritoriality of today and what is novel in the third sort of occupation of which all of us, in one degree or another, are subjected. Well, I would like to mention two new elements. One, in order to explain what I have in mind, I will reach back to an uh, antique, ancient uh, writer of fairy tales, Aesop. And Aesop, among other fairy tales, produced also one about hares and frogs. The story is like that, uh, shortly put. Uh, hares are very cowardly animals. They are persecuted by all other animals. They are all fear, constantly afraid. When they hear some an other animal approaching, they are just running away. And once upon a time, they were running away across a pond. And what they saw there, the frogs, which were sitting quietly in the pond, started running away, running away, trying to salvage them from whom? From these cowardly uh, and frightened hares. And uh, that was very good news for hares, because there is something, there is someone, who is even in worse position, in, in worse pickle than we are. Someone who is afraid of us, who are afraid of everybody. Now, that uh, in a sense, that it's not a joke, really. It is a very, very serious psychological problem, really. But uh, that's a liberating uh, discovery, a liberating discovery. But in order to make this discovery useful, what do you need? You need to show to those frogs that they are in a really much worse situation than we are. We are not at the bottom. Under our bottom, there is still beneath another bottom, even deeper. And we are becoming something like relatively privileged by comparison with them. So it is task of the hares from now on to make frogs run and increase, swell their, <coughs> their uh, fear as much as is possible. That's, all, that's exactly what's happening today. That's what exactly what's happening today. I don't know whether you read the latest uh, public opinion polls. The, there was a cross-European investigation asking uh, people, what is your greatest worry today? 40% of research Europeans said the influx of foreigners. In fact, of 40 percent. That was the issue named by the greatest amount of people. All the other issues, even issues which could justify a worry, a very serious worry, 
are the prospects of uh, gainful employment, for example, or the possibility of education for your children, or the availability of health service in the case of need, and so on and so on. And uh, uh, among British citizens, there was another uh, investigation asking the question, what do you think is the greatest problem of our times? And one in two Britain named mass migration. That is the situation. I wonder whether you remember the story of civil war in the United States of America in the 19th century. And uh, if you ever studied it, you would probably find that uh, people in the southern states of uh, uh, North America who were particularly uh, inimical, hateful for the freshly liberated black people there were people who were called derisively by the owners of, of uh, uh, Southern States plantation the white trash. People at the same bottom of the, of the bottom of the hierarchy of white population in Southern States. They were interested in pushing the, the former slaves so much down as humanly possible, just to save their own self-esteem. On the other uh, end of the time axis, take Marie Le Pen in France, who uh, gathers hundreds of thousands and millions already of votes around her slogan. France for Frenchmen. France for Frenchmen. That means that people who are not sure whether they are welcome in their own French society, who are harmed, who are damaged, who cannot make the proper living <coughs> inside them. They want to show that at least they share with other dignified part of um, the French society the fact that they are French. And those newcomers, those strangers who came, uh, one doesn't know where from, uh, they have no title to classify themselves in the same category. <coughs> it is a st status war, in a sense. It, feel, it seems uh, crazy, inane, but nevertheless, it is, according to psychologists, it is a very uh, evident tendency of uh, reflection of the social inequality in individual psyche. That is how it reflects itself. The second point which I wanted to make to you uh, is uh, in the fact that uh, as Jonathan uh, Rutherford, another Londoner, I wonder whether he's known in his college, he's a very wise man, very inspiring, I recommend him to your attention. Jonathan uh, uh, pointed out that the migrants, particularly the refugees, bring uh, Our uncertainties, our fears, which we try very hard to stifle, but unsuccessfully, from faraway places to our own threshold. Well, 
if you think about it, I'm quite sure you will find out that you, this idea came to you as well, independently. That those people who are coming to knock to uh, European doors are people who yesterday had their homes, had their independent living, had their neighborhood which they liked. Some neighbors liked, some disliked, but nevertheless they felt their chez soi at home. Yesterday that was happening. Today, look. Today they are homeless, they are running for life. Everything they worked for in their life is lost. They had to abandon their past and start from scratch. Well, <coughs> long before Jonathan Rutherford, actually, the German uh, poet and also playwright Brecht uh, pointed out that the refugees are the harbingers of bad tidings. Look what is happening to other people. They look quite normal. Some of them are even educated. They are very much like us. Not much difference between them. And look what has happened to them. Why not to me? Why not it is precluded that it may happen to me as well? All the fears, I repeat, which daily we are trying, trying to stifle, we are try, try, trying to, uh, striving to run away from that, that morbid ideas, busying ourselves in all sorts of other activities. Now, all these fears are flowing now because you see them next to you, in the same street, to the surface, to the surface. And, uh, my dear friends, as you know, there's the old human habit to hang the messenger for the content of news which messenger brings. So, no wonder that they, their sight is repellent. How to get rid of their sight? Send them home. Better still, build sky-high wall and not allow them to, to, to come here. That is the second element, which I uh, uh, warned you that I would like to make. These two elements make the consequences, social political consequences, particularly dreadful and particularly potentially menacing. Uh, Europe doesn't remember for quite a long time such degree, such intensity of mutual <coughs> hatred, of, the, of uh, mutual suspicion uh, of uh, uh, strangers. Strangers are always, mind you, disquieting persons. You don't know exactly what they are for, what they are after, what their intentions are. So there is always some degree <coughs> of unpleasant uncertainty about them. But this time, it is much, much magnified. Precisely because they embody to us that what we fear most, that somewhere there, far away, unreachable, invisible, there are forces which are about to destroy our life. We call them, in short, globalization, global forces, mysterious forces. We don't control them. And here you have their avant-garde, so to speak, coming to knock to our doors. This uh, relationship to strangers sharpened by these two considerations which I just made are with us here to stay. 
uh, rather <coughs> uh, effect of death, another effect of death, very serious one, is the explosion of populistic exploitation of these inner fears of ordinary people in Europe. They are exploiting it. They know that there are very, very many votes in, uh, in uh, demanding stronger laws against refugees and finding pretexts on which you can actually expel them from the country. Or better still, not to let them in in the first place. The, uh, there is a rise, you probably read newspapers still, in spite of having mobile telephones, smart telephones and internet access, you still read papers and papers were full about the results of latest elections in Germany. Germany, which was uh, a symbol of the post-war European democracy and hospitality and living together in peace and so on, voted in the extreme right-wing parties, uh, which uh, made the election, went to election under one slogan only. There was no other temptation, no other attempt to seduce the population, apart from this one. Lock the door to immigration. The most popular among the politicians today argument, helping them to gather these crops of popular support, is uh, connecting the issue of migration with the issue of Secure. What I call securitization of the issue of contemporary migration. They are dangerous to our living. Not only that they will steal our uh, jobs, but that they are literally prospective terrorists armed to us, <coughs> who hate our way of life. And therefore they came here not in order to get a living, but in order to destroy the world which we know and which we like. Securitization. 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 Uh, well, sorry, another digression. I would uh, advise you to read also a recent book by George Lakoff, once upon a time the author of the really mind-opening study of <coughs> metaphors, the role of metaphors in our thinking. This time the book is called Do Not Think About the Elephant. It's a half joke, of course, but the uh, book is very, very serious. It simply shows how the frame concept which introduces thinking, introduces debating of a particular issue, how does it change the meaning of what follows? How it creates the meaning? When you classify problem of migration in the rubric in the category of security problems, then on the one hand, you free yourself from all sorts of moral scruples. <coughs> well, uh, criminals should be avenged, criminals should be punished, and there is nothing immoral about it. They are here because they are potentially terrorists. No one actually said, after the Parisian assault, uh, if you still remember, a few uh, weeks ago, that no one mentioned that only two participants of this uh, night event were coming from abroad, were actually immigrants. All the rest were born and bred in France. But contrary to the fact, that is a catching argument. 
putting together all these considerations which I uh, gave you uh, before, it is very, very critical. They are no longer problem. <coughs> problem of moral obligations, of doing something for people who actually need our help. I wonder whether I find it or not. Uh, I will try. Bear with me for a moment. Well, there is uh, another possibility, of course, treat this issue not as an issue of uh, security, but uh, as an issue of most vulnerable part of humanity in search of restoration of rights of which they have been violently robbed. But Michel Agier, one of the foremost authority in studying the issue of refugees, homeless people, worldless people, worldless people, as Hannah Arendt called them, uh, points out he is the topmost authority of the plight of our worldless, stateless contemporaries. He writes that camps which we open all over the place, here in Europe and also in neighboring countries, in North Africa, in parts of the Middle East, uh, camps you will no longer be used, I quote from him, just to keep vulnerable refugees alive. But rather to park and guard all kinds of undesirable population. Well, uh, if you know the expression out places, now the camps are on the way to become such outpaces, where people are in a territory, but not off the territory. They don't belong there. They are there simply to prevent them from making few steps right or left or back or, front, or to the front. So we are st facing now Ah, one more quotation, the last one, I promise. The penultimate one. Uh, it comes from George Lakoff's book, which I mentioned before. Uh, what, what he writes, not directly about the issue I'm discussing at the moment, but that the problem of security as metaphor, shaping our way of thinking and recognizing reality around us. He says, there is the basic security metaphor, security as containment, keeping the evil doers out. Secure our borders, keep them and their weapons out of, their, of our airports, have marshals on the plane. Most security experts say that there is no sure way to keep terrorists out or to deny them the use of some weapon or other. A determined, well-financed terrorist organization can penetrate any security system. So we are all in danger. We are all in danger because the most people who came to us seeking bread and water, they actually wanted to destroy the Western civilization and our way of life. What is the alternative? That's a very big question, a very serious question, and a very difficult to answer question. Uh, the other side, well, this I already mentioned. Treat it as a moral problem. 
as the issue of people really in very bad situation. The choice open to the so-called economic migrant is one between famine and prospectless vegetation versus a chance, however tedious, of livable, however miserably conditioned. This is not really a choice in any meaningful sense. Each one of us, I suggest it to you, would be horrified by the necessity to make and undergo these unimaginable circumstances, let alone choose to confront the implications. The same applies to refugees. In most cases, the choice open to a refugee is between a place where his presence is not tolerated and another where his arrival is unwanted and disallowed. Also not a choice which we would like to make ourselves. So it is a big moral problem. It is the question, I'm very pleased that this great book starts with reference to Levinas. He was very, very sharp about stating that issue. Morality is relationship to the other. I'm not taking the, the, from the other for myself. So this is this is this course not for making the choice. This be, this uh, means making such a choice unrealistic, unexisting, redundant, unreasonable. To support this last suggestion which I wanted to make to you, I would like to quote this time from Pope Francis. Pope Francis, who is, uh, in my view, the only one at the moment public figure of great influence who dares to say what is really all that about, however unpopular his statements could be. Pope Francis uh, visited Lampedusa, the famous uh, Italian island where most illegal immigrants landed on 8th July 2013. And I will quote from the speech which he made there, inspired by what we have seen there. How many of us, so said Pope Francis, myself, that means himself <coughs> included, <coughs> have lost our bearings. <coughs> we are no longer attentive to the world in which we live. We don't care. We don't protect what God created for everyone. And we end up unable even to care for one another. <coughs> and when humanity as a whole loses its bearings, it results in tragedies like the one we are witnessing. The question has to be asked, who is responsible for the blood of these brothers and sisters of ours? Nobody. That is our answer. Nobody. I don't have anything to do with it. It must be someone else, but certainly not me. Today, no one in our world feels responsible. We have lost a sense of responsibility for our brothers and sisters. The culture of comfort, which makes us think only of ourselves, 
makes us insensitive to the cries of other people, make us live in soap bubbles, which, however lovely, are insubstantial. They offer a fleeting and empty illusion, which results in indifference to others. Indeed, it even leads to the globalization of indifference. In this globalized world, we have fallen into globalized indifference. We have become used to the suffering of others. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't concern me. It is none of my business. And he ends his speech with a calling, which also I would like to repeat after him. He calls to remove the part of hero that lark, lurks in our hearts. Let us ask the Lord for the grace to weep over our indifference, to weep over the cruelty of our world, of our own hearts, and of all those who in anonymity make social and economic decisions which open the door to tragic situations like that. Having said that, Pope Francis asks, has anyone wept today? Has anyone wept in the world? Sigmund Bauman for this absolutely challenging, both intellectually uh, and politically, um, also ethically, um, in taking us through the, the the problems, the most the most uh, important problems of uh, and challenges of of the present. I'd like to join you also in. Um, in commending uh, the uh, great project of Forti Stella in Mayana Mir, uh, that project, um, extraterritorialities in a, in a, in an occupied world, um, I think that's a great book. I know also that Mayan's next book uh, is even greater than that. Uh, I know, I know, um, uh. I know the next book in the making. And I know also that that book, like it will be, I think, for many of us, uh, has been for Mayan almost an operative, uh, a full of operative concept. Because Mayan's project, practice as an artist, together with Rotisella, is taking extraterritoriality not as a, as a field of intellectual reflection, but as a field of activism, as a field of practice, and in her case, as a field of image production. Mayan's next book is on the extraterritorial image, and seeds of it uh, are already here. And, um, and I know uh, very much that Mayan's engagement with extraterritoriality, Mayan and Ruti's, uh, <coughs> the fact that that book was made, the reason we and you will all hold it in your hand after you buy the, the few copies that are here, is because it is a, an absolutely essential struggle that um, as an artist and a scholar, um, Mayan and Ruti were undertaking in relation to various problems of extraterritoriality and extraterritorialization uh, that uh, she experienced and lives through uh, in Israel-Palestine, right? Uh, in relation to to Gaza, in relation to her work in the Mediterranean as an extraterritorial space to state jurisdiction, to state control, 
in relation to the work on the flotilla, on the humanitarian flotillas that are trying to break uh, the siege uh, of Gaza. So that is that book is really uh, is much more than an intellectual exercise. It's, a, it's an operative manual, and we need to understand concepts as operative manuals in that sense. Uh, sharing some of Mayan's um, biography, we both come obviously from Israel, I have to admit something, and that is that uh, I know Zig Zygmunt Bauman, of course, now having read many of his books, but I initially know him as the grandfather of another great uh, person, uh, a great uh, a lawyer in Israel called Michael Sfard. Uh, Michael Sfard is one of Israel's foremost human rights lawyers, uh, a person that spends, um, in fact, all of his professional life in defending the most vulnerable uh, in uh, people under Israeli uh, control, both in what is called Israel proper and the area it occupies, both <coughs> in Gaza in the West Bank, uh, in the in the desert and in other places. And uh, he always was telling me, my grandfather is a sociologist. And I thought, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> that's fine. But I did not realize the kind of, until, you know, I, I, then I, you know, I would read and I, I would know Zygmunt Bauman's work. I would, uh, we would work in forensic architecture, work very closely with Michael. Uh, but we somehow never made those, uh, this connection. And now that it is made, it is very obvious uh, that, that there is a kind of a shared intellectual and political conception that goes together. Uh, we've made many projects together. As I said, in Forensic Architect, we made many projects with uh, Michael. Uh, one of them would be the starting point of uh, my response to Zygmunt Bauman's uh, presentation. Um, of course, the, the question, perhaps the greatest challenge of extraterritoriality, uh, when you speak about human rights lawyers, such as Michael Sfard, uh, is that of the very notion, the very function of human rights. A principle that is beyond the rules, the laws uh, of the state, that, that transcends them, um, but is in itself a kind of a problematic, sometimes, sometimes a very tricky concept to work with. Um, we've made uh, various projects on the frame of human rights, but it was one in particular when Michael uh, approached us and with another idea that he had. Of course, Michael was one of the lawyers that were... Um, working very closely with Palestinian communities along the wall that Israel builds in Palestinian lands and um, takes the representative of those communities versus the, the army and the Ministry of Defense. But in one location, he said, you know what? That principle of human rights doesn't work here. Right? Whenever we appeal on behalf of human rights, the state says, well, security, as also Zygmunt Bauman now said, trumps human rights. If you put security on the one hand, human rights on the other, finally the judges would rule for security rather than for human rights. And he said in that particular case, and it was the village of Batir, a very beautiful historical village south of Jerusalem, Michael Sfard said, I want to appeal on behalf of another extraterritorial concept, and that is on behalf of the rights of the environment, right? So we will not appeal for the right of the people. Of course, what we want is to stop the wall from being there, but we would appeal on the right of the environment, for its continuity, for the rights of archaeology in it, for its natural beauty, etc. And that, taking that approach, he was able, with a you know, very, very small contribution from us, basically just modeling and doing the analysis, some analysis for him, uh, for it, to appeal um, for the right of the environment not to be divided, right? The right of nature not to be territorialized, that is, parceled out, right? And in that, he was successful. So now there is the wall, and it would go all the way 
until that beautiful terraces, Roman terraces of Batir, for a kilometer and a half there will never be a wall and the wall will continue later. And the minute that you <coughs> manage to create a little hole in a bucket, the bucket doesn't hold water anymore, right? I mean, what is, uh, what is a wall with a hole in it? And based on that concept, a much bigger political claim could now be made. But what I wanted to add, thinking about the right of the environment, thinking about that place being an agricultural place, is to add perhaps another thought uh, to those typologies of migrations and refugeeness and refugeehood that we experience uh, today, and that is the idea of climate refugees. When we think about climate refugees, we need to think about the very foundation of what territory is. And I think, or oh, I think that I've understood also from your, from your talk, Sigmund Bauman, now, is that the act of movement, the act of movement across space <coughs> is no tragedy. This is in fact what we human do. You become a migrant and you become a refugee when that movement crosses a nominal threshold that somebody said is a border. And across that border faces enormous violence. And the entire movement that is now fragmented by borders, walls such as that in the West Bank, or such as those of Fortress Europe, or such as the fortification of the Mediterranean, is what makes uh, migration and refugeeness violent. Right? Um, I, I would say that the relationship between movement and climate are absolutely obvious. Uh, before there was territory even, and I see Stuart here also, and perhaps he could uh, enlighten us more about the kind of the history of the notion of territory, um, there was movement. There was movement across space. It is really with, uh, in, in an absolutely brilliant formulation of a historian called Yuval Noah Harari, when wheat domesticated humans, right? that the problem of, of the, the kind of criminalization of movement would uh, first appear. What does it mean that we domesticated you? We think we domesticated wheat. I mean, what is wheat? Wheat is simply a kind of a weed that was growing somewhere in southern Turkey, um, not, particular, not in particular concentration amongst other weeds and between other trees and bushes. But it had a kind of characteristic that was not only uh, that it was nutritious, of course, there is some nutrition in cereals, it could be conserved, it could be preserved. And its preservation meant uh, that humans and wheat started co-evolving. Wheat likes flat surfaces. Human made for wheat flat surfaces. Wheat does not like big stones. Uh, growing on where it is growing. So men and women break their back taking those stones out of those fields. Wheat needs sometimes extra watering. So humans brought that to wheat. Wheat needed this constant oversight so men settled in cities and demarcated territories, right? Wheat domesticated humans rather than human Domesticate quite literally. What is to domesticate? To put into a kind of a domus, a home, to put you into uh, a place where uh, where you would be settled uh, and permanent. So that uh, the idea of um, territory, and now we see very often, um, or we hear very often that exactly that band that Sigmund Bauman described that cuts across Africa, in fact, cutting across the Sahel from Eritrea in the east to Mali uh, in the west, and along which we have a kind of entangled process. We have state violence, 
and we have desertification. Desertification and violence work together to produce these conditions <coughs> of movement. Movement that would have been natural if there would not have been a border across which you need to move in order for that movement to be criminalized, right? And I think that um, even today we need to think about those climatic thresholds that cut across uh, the planet and produce for us and propel that movement that has been criminalized through this earlier kind of domestication of humans uh, by wheat, right? So if you think about those thresholds, a threshold of the desert, a band, a kind of a political equator that runs all around the world, right? As uh, thresholds of wheat, uh, of water, beyond which wheat can no longer grow, right? that were, in fact, the end of law. Law applied until the last field of wheat that could be, or cereal, that could be cultivated. The area of the desert was extraterritorial. That is, and we today tend to think of extraterritorial through the kind of Agamben's notion of the camp as kind of, uh, uh, you know, various kind of enclaves and exclaves. But think about it initially as a kind of an equator that, dis that, that divides that area that is controlled, that is governed from the area in which there is no law, in which there is no state control, in which the state, by definition, being wheat, the state being an instrument of that organism, wheat, right? The, 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 the instrument that regulates, that cultivates, that has been created by that very successful plant, because now it covers, whatever, 17% of the surface, the dry surface of the earth, um, has been, um, that, that movement creates and shifts continuously the borders between territory and ex-territory. Another one is, so this would be the threshold of too little water, you'd have one of too much water, the rainforest. The rainforests themselves with areas unsuitable for cultivation. Themselves areas outside of the state, areas outside of the law in which uh, the native people were considered simply as part of the environment. The indigenous people that were living there uh, in that terra nullius uh, were seen not as legal subjects. Uh, so that area or that band, another band of the ex-territory, and think about another one that collects the water, that of the frozen tundra in the north, uh, in which, an uh, area beyond which the state, uh, the law, could not penetrate. Right? And then I want you to think about those movements, not only as movements across borders, not only of movement of... Um, uh, of people in space, <coughs> but to think about climate change as the displacement of the weather, as a displacement of the climate itself, right? So there is another refugee here, a meta-refugee, the climate itself that is chased away by these processes and that uh, in itself produces a kind of movement that was... Um, you know, perhaps, uh, regardless, if you forget about the last 8,000 years, the mere blip in kind of in the history of, of, of mankind um, that criminalizes that movement that people always undertook together with the climate and, um, and now uh, within which we must live. And I think that the notion of climate refugees is the kind of those migrants and refugees are the, are the migrants and refugees of the future. I think that we need to be tuned to those um, people that need to uh, abandon their sinking island, that need to abandon, abandon their, their drying fields, 
that need to abandon the forest that is now turning into uh, soy fields or um, palm oil or anything uh, like that and to understand that in there, in that notion of the climate refugee, uh, we see uh, also our future. Thank you for your talk.